The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. There's no other way to put it. This is a weird place to begin the story. The gospel according to St. John starts with a long, poetic speech about the divine word of God being made flesh, and follows it up with John the Baptist's cryptic lines about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And on John the Baptist's behalf, a few people start following Jesus. After that, boom, here we are at a wedding. In John's telling of it, this is the first thing Jesus does. Goes to a wedding and turns water into wine. By comparison, none of the other evangelists thought this story important enough to even mention it. But to our author today, this, this is how Christ suddenly reveals his glory through a parlor trick, which he was hesitant to perform in the first place. Later in the same gospel, our Lord heals people. He takes a few fishes and a few loaves of bread, and with them, he feeds the multitude. He walks on water. St. John is the one who tells us that Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. All of these miracles seem far more glorious than turning water into wine. Add to this that John tends to rearrange parts of the story, to put events in different places, to bring more attention to them, presenting a non-linear story that jumps from place to place, to place. And we have to wonder, why? Why start here? Why lead off with something so relatively minor, something so everyday, something so commonplace as a party scene? 
Where's the hook, that thing that grabs you by the shirt and says, pay attention? John could have easily slipped the story into the middle as an interesting side note to keep us interested between long, confusing, metaphysical speeches and started off with something a little more awe-inspiring. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and said some complicated stuff about being the bread of life. And, oh, you're starting to look a little bit confused and lost, so let me tell you about this wedding he went to and something he did there. But no, it's front and center. It's concluded with words far more important than what we think we just read. On the third day, there was a wedding. Jesus was there with his family and his disciples, And then it happens, the faux pas to end all wedding faux pas. The first century equivalent of Emily Post would have been shocked. They ran out of wine. Imagine today going to a wedding where they run out of cake. You can imagine the servers exchanging nervous glances back and forth. What are we going to do? Do you have any more? One of them tries to stall for time. I'm I'm sorry, sir, this bottle is empty. I, I know we have some more out in the courtyard. I will go get it. I'll be back in just a moment. I apologize. All of the while knowing that he's going to have to break the bad news. Into this tense situation, enter Mary, stepping forward to offer her son services. Hey, They just ran out of wine. Can you believe that? You can fix this. Go do something. And Jesus tries to get out of it, not in a disrespectful way, but he says, Mom, I'm not here to show off. Today is about the couple and their family and their new life together. Not about me. Besides, they're the ones who ran out of wine. I mean, that's got to be on them. Undeterred, Mary tells the servants, you see my son over there? Drop what you're doing and go follow him. He'll take care of this, um, how to put this delicately, this, this little situation. Christ tells the servants to fill up some jars, the first century equivalent of the kitchen sink, with water. To scoop that water out and to take it to the chief steward. That's it. Just a few simple commands. He doesn't really even lift a finger. But the servants listen, and they take the chalice to the head steward. And lo and behold, the sink water is now an amazing wine. The steward is so impressed with this new vintage that he runs up to the groom on his wedding day in front of all of his guests and exclaims, You know, usually people save the good stuff, serve the good stuff up front, and they save the cheap wine for after everybody's too drunk to know the difference. But you, you've saved the best for last. And this, according to St. John, is why the disciples believe in Christ. Now far be it for me to second guess the evangelist, but is he really leading with his best foot forward? It's a fun story to be sure, But glorious seems like a bit of a stretch. Lest I seem too dismissive, the story is not entirely insignificant. This is a story about God providing, about supplying something essential to human life. It's about Christ blessing marriage by his presence at the wedding feast. It's about God's ability to, to provide. It's about food. So much of Christ's ministry centers around the table, the feeding of the 5,000, sharing meals with outcasts and with sinners. It's over a meal that he brings Peter back into the fold. It's over a meal that Christ's new law is issued forth. Love one another. 
And it's over a meal that we see now Christ acting as the creator, the word through whom all things are made, turning water into wine. To be sure, that is glorious enough. But why put it at the beginning? Why is this how Christ starts his ministry? It's exactly because it's the beginning of the story that this narrative works so well. John is leading with a glimpse of things to come. The wedding at Cana is like the prelude to a great symphony, setting up the themes that will weave in and out and back and forth through the music, the meaningful echoes that will punctuate the work to follow. Jesus is at a wedding, and he provides for the bridegroom. A chapter later, John the Baptist, who has already testified that the coming Messiah is the Lamb of God, tells his followers that Christ is the true bridegroom. Jesus turns water into wine, and he later tells us that he is the true vine. Jesus does something on the third day, and later he conquers the grave on the third day. These are the themes of John's great symphony of a gospel. Yes, God provides, but it's so much more than we can understand. God's provision is not just about the here and the now, but rather it's about the as it was and the beginning, the is now and the will be forever. Christ's miraculous work doesn't stop at Cana. It doesn't stop in Jerusalem. It doesn't stop on Easter. It doesn't stop at the end of the gospel. It carries forward. And as we struggle to understand God's provision now, we do so knowing that we see it through a mirror dimly. God's glory has been revealed to the nations through Christ, but we catch only glimpses and we hear only echoes. This is but a foretaste of the feast to come. These are the themes that resound throughout the entirety of of our faith. At a feast, Christ made wine for the bridegroom. At a feast, Christ, our bridegroom, our true vine, promised to be present at our table as we celebrate and even participate in his glorious death and resurrection. And at the last, at that great heavenly feast, Christ will be present as we live into the resurrection. The wedding at Cana tells us how to live, tells us to trust in God's abundance. St. John tells us to trust that on the third day, something amazing will happen, to trust that God will provide far more than we will ever need. As for now, we are called to act in faith of things to come, to act upon the promise Christ has made to us. As the prophet Isaiah tells us, we will not be forsaken. In celebration of our union with Christ, of our Lord's promise to provide, we are sent out to proclaim God's glory and word and in deed. God has provided good things, and we are sent out to share this goodness with the world. What then shall we do? God has provided for us abundantly. Will we measure out a single, minuscule portion out of the fear that our supply will be exhausted? Shall we stall for time? Do we worry that we will run out? Are we stingy with God's grace? 
Do we impose quotas on love? Do we ration life? Or do we share abundantly, knowing that we have an abundant, even a boundless supply of good wine, which will never run dry? Do we act extravagantly, giving of ourselves? Brothers and sisters, let us pour ourselves out. Let us act extravagantly, trusting that when we run dry, trusting that when we are nearly overcome, trusting that when sin and death threaten to overpower us, when they do overpower us, God's grace will show up. Trusting that Christ, our true vine, will provide. Let us share our cup of blessing knowing that our bridegroom will be there to refill us. Let us share our lives, even unto death, knowing that on the third day, God will redeem us. We have been given a tremendous banquet, and now we are called to go out and to invite everyone to share in the feast. We are to sound the invitation far and wide, knowing that we will not run out, knowing that our supply will not be exhausted, knowing that the feast points to something better, that sharing in that sacred meal is a participation in better things to come. So come, outcasts. Come, sinners. It is the third day. Our risen Lord, our bridegroom, our true vine is coming to meet us around this great banquet. Come, for now is the feast. Now, the celebration. Amen. I realized that I have not actually done a Thanksgiving moment yet, which means that I've not had the opportunity to thank everyone for welcoming me into this congregation, for 
opening their arms to my wife and I for all of the work that I know that taking on an intern requires. Um, I've had a great half year so far of learning from a wonderful staff and from wonderful lay volunteers being led by a wonderful internship committee. And to them, I say thank you, but also to all of you for this church to work the way it does requires a a vigorous commitment from the laity, from everyone who is here faithfully on Saturday night and Sunday morning, for everyone who shows up to Wednesday night fellowship meals, to everyone who leads in Bible studies, who participates in Bible studies, who sings in the choir, and to watch this church work, to watch this parish do ministry is a truly amazing experience. And so for sharing your life together as a congregation with me from the bottom of my heart, thank you.